Uh, we're on the taming of Smeagol, correct? I'm trying to make sure because I'm, I'm getting my classes all confused. So, Frodo gets Gollum. So, page 614, 615. Um, they see Gollum climbing down the cliffs, uh, scrambling down the cliffs, and they capture him. Gollum bites Sam on the shoulder. And Frodo and Sam, you know, wonder what they're going to do with Gollum. And Sam says, bottom of 614, what's to be done with it? Tie it up so as it can't come sneaking after us no more, I say. Gollum, but that would kill us, kill us, cruel little hobbits and blah, blah, blah. Frodo, nope, if we kill him, we must kill him outright. In other words, Frodo means what? If we're going to kill Gollum, how must it be done? What do you mean by outright? What would Sam's suggestion result in? Starving to death, being tortured by the ropes, because the ropes are made by the elves. Okay, you can put it humane, quick, and active. Sam is suggesting a passive death. Let's just leave him here to starve and wither away. Frodo's saying, nope, if we're going to kill him, we have to kill him outright. In other words, we have to do it. All right? And he says, poor wretch, he has done us no harm. Sam, rubbing his shoulder, oh, he hasn't he? He meant to, and he means to. He meant to, that is, when he was coming down here and you know talking about magazines, etc. And he means to. He's planning to. Throttle us in our sleep, that's his plan. Frodo, you're right, I dare say. When someone says, I dare say, they, what they're saying is, I entirely agree with you. But what he means to do is another matter. That is saying we can't kill him because he means to kill us. <clears throat> now, I make a lot of references in this class to 9-11, you know, Bush, the war on terror, and all that kind of stuff. One of the things that happened after 9-11, and it happened, I think it was, in around 2002, is what's called the National Defense Posture. Change the national. If I'm if I'm thinking of the right term, the national defense posture is kind of a document that spells out what our defense policy will be going forward, right? And one of the things the Bush administration did fairly early on was they came up with the idea of it's kind of usually called this the doctrine of preemptive war. Right? It wasn't totally new because back in the 60s, really back in the 50s, the U.S. and other countries came up with the idea of first strike capability. That is, we had more nuclear weapons than anybody else. And in the late 50s, early 60s, you know, as Russia was, uh, you know, as the Soviet Union was getting stronger, they realized. First strike capability means we can wipe out all their nukes before they do anything. So Russia, you know, ramped up all the nukes they had, led to the Cuban Missile Crisis, as an example. So that developed into what's called MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction. You launch your nukes at us, we're going to launch our nukes at you, and there will be no United States and Soviet Union. It'll just be left for the other, you know, nations to pick up the scraps of you. The Bush administration came up with this idea. Let's strike our enemies first before they strike at us. This is what led to the war in Iraq. Because the intelligence community said Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. He's used them before. That part was true. He had gassed his own people. Okay? So let's Go in and take them away. Let's keep him from being able to use them either against his own people, against his neighbors, or you know, 
against us. Frodo is saying we can't do that. Frodo is saying, we can only kill Gollum if he tries to kill us first. And he pauses. And he looks at Gollum. And he presses rewind. And he plays the conversation in his mind that he and Gandalf had all those months before back in the Shire at his home. And then he says aloud, in response to that Memory, very well, but still I am afraid. And yet, as you see, who's the you he's speaking to? The memory of Gandalf? Because according to Frodo, and what Frodo knows and believes at this point, where's Gandalf? Dead. Okay? I will not touch the creature, for now that I see him, I do. Remember, he didn't want to see Gollum because he didn't want to feel pity. Now that he sees him, he does. So, he forces Gollum to swear an oath. Gollum offers to swear. Frodo doesn't bring it up. Gollum does. He says, we'll swear on the precious. Notice what he says, 618. We will swear to do what he wants. Swear? Gollum. Smeagol. Smeagol will swear on the precious. So first he says we, then he says Smeagol. What's the difference between we and Smeagol? Louder? Gollum isn't also swearing. We refers to Gollum in the ring. Smeagol refers to what? His innermost being, yeah. That part of the real creature, Smeagol, that still exists. That bit of his psyche, of his self, if you want. Okay? So Frodo stands up, you know, tall as he can, and cites the line from the verse, and he says, you'll swear on that, it will hold you to it. So Gollum says, we promise it, yes. I promise. We, you know, schizoid kind of personality, and then moves to I. I promise. I will serve, and notice, he uses perfectly good English. <laughs> I will serve the master of the precious. Good master, good smeagol. And this is where Frodo demonstrates to us that he failed, you know, introductory contract negotiation. Because what does it he require Gollum to do? What's the flaw in that agreement? The master is vague. Who can be the master of the precious? Anybody who has the ring. Frodo should have said, no, no, Gollum, that's not good enough. Here's what you'll swear. I, Gollum, a.k.a. Smeagol, will swear to Frodo Baggins, a.k.a. Frodo Underhill, the name Tom Bombadil partially gave them, of number four, Bagshot Row, a.k.a. Bag In, the master of the precious, you know, da 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 He doesn't specify the terms. So we're going to see in a few pages a debate that Gollum and Smeagol have. Two sides of his personality. And Gollum's going to say, but what if we was the precious? What if we was the master of the precious? Yes, then we'll swear to ourselves. You know? So Gollum agrees to lead them. And where is he going to lead them? To Mordor. Okay? Pretty simple. We get chapter two, the passage of the marshes. What are the dead marshes? I don't, it's not a silly question, because they're obviously dead marshes, but how did they become what they are? What happened there years and years and years ago? The Battle of the Gladden Fields, that was referred to in the Council of Elrond. OK? 
Okay? So, page 625. <clears throat> They're now in this marshy area, fins all around, so you got, you know, some solid places to step, but other places you step, and you sink, and you're dead, okay? And we're told 625, towards the bottom, little short, two-sentence paragraph, how do we shape our course now, Sea Gull? Frodo asks. In other words, how do we pick our way through this swamp? Must we cross these evil smelling fins? Go. No. You don't have to. We could go another way. It's a harder way. It's a more circuitous route. It will take a lot more, a lot more time. Right? So they decide to make this way. They go through, they start going through, page 627 at the bottom. They're making their way through, and Sam and Frodo notice lights in the pools of water. Now, if you want to read this book scientifically, and people have written articles about this, what might these lights be, scientifically speaking? What do marshes sometimes produce? Marsh gas. It's caused by decomposing, rotting material in the water. It rises up, and when it hits the air, it kind of turns phosphorescent. It gives off a color, a light, okay? Nice scientific explanation. What's a rainbow? It's the light refracting through water droplets in the air. Scientific explanation. Bottom of 627. Sam trips as they're making their way. He falls on his hands. His hands go into the ooze, and his face comes almost to the level of the water. And Sam says, there are dead things, dead faces in the water. Dead faces. Gollum laughs. The dead marshes, yes, yes, that is their thing. Should not look in when the candles are lit. That is, when there are lights, don't look in. Who are they? What are they? Brother, I don't know, but I've seen them too. In the pools when the candles were lit. They lie in all the pools, pale faces, deep, deep under the dark water. I saw them grim faces and evil and noble faces and sad, many faces proud and fair and weeds in their silver hair, but all foul, all rotting, all dead. A fell light is in them. Fell means terrible. I know not who they are, but I thought I saw their men and elves and orcs. And Gollum goes on and he talks about the battle that occurred years and years and years and years ago. Right? Interesting little trivia note, or take that back, not trivia, background note. In World War I, when British Allied forces were engaged in trench warfare, and, you know, where they had in fields, they had a trench dug, and then maybe 20 or 30 yards away would be another trench, etc., and Moving on. <clears throat> Soldiers were often required to get up out of a trench while they were under heavy bombardment and move to the next trench to try to gain land, territory, and such. We have accounts by at least four or five soldiers who survived of them getting up out of their trench, crawling hands and knees and at hearing the whistle of a bomb coming, so they get down flat, and looking into puddles and seeing faces. The faces were disembodied or decapitated heads. Of guys, you know, coming up, going across, and being hit by a cannon. Cannon, right here, heads are gone. And those heads lying face up in the ground, guys crawling and seeing those. Now, Tolkien, as far as we know, never personally experienced that himself, but he knew others who did. <laughs> here's, an, here's an example of how somebody's personal, you know, biography kind of finds its way in, so to speak. So, 
They keep going on. Gollum does lead them through the dead marshes. And they make their way to bottom of 631, what the narrator calls the desolation that lay before Mordor. Slag heaps all over. It's like vol volcanic, you know, rock with no living vegetation anywhere. <clears throat> Bottom of 632. So they go to sleep one night. They're on a slope. Sorry. And Sam wakes up and he sees Frodo has slid down to the bottom of the slope. And Gollum is there next to him. And Gollum is talking. He's not talking to Frodo. He's talking to himself. And the narrator gives us what Sam hears. <clears throat> so we have all promise. Yes, yes, precious. We promise to save our precious Natalie. And it goes back and forth like that. All right? And Sam hears, bottom of 633. We want it. Here there is a long pause, as if a new thought had awakened. Not yet, eh? Perhaps not. She might help. She might. Yes. No, no, not that way. Yes, we want it. We want it. Each time that the second, second thought, second thought spoke, we're told, Gollum's long hand crept out slowly towards Frodo. And then was drawn back as Smeagol spoke. This is foreshadowing. This is, this is pointing towards the end of this book. Not quite the exact end, second to the last chapter. Yeah, kind of does. So Sam watches all this, and then he makes a noise so that God realizes he's being watched. Right? And they go to the Black Gate. The Black Gate is literally what it sounds like. It's the entrance to mortar and it's a big black iron gate. Not because black is bad, it's the color of the iron, period. All right? And 637, Sam's like, well, here we are, there's the gate. Now what? All right? And Gollum's like, Master said, bring me to the gate. I brought you to the gate. All right? Frodo's like, is there another way? Yes, there is. Why didn't you tell me? You never asked. But Frodo also asked, as they talk, is this other way guarded? And Gollum kind of says, yes, it is. All right? <clears throat> so 640-41, that's when they have this conversation. Gollum 641 says there is a third way. Talks about the old fortress. What he's talking about is Minas, I guess I misspoke yesterday, Minas, Morgul, which used to be called Menace Ithil. It's no longer called that. Now it's called Menace Morgul. All right? Tower of the Moon. What, by the way, does the two towers refer to? What are the two towers? <laughs> Is it really, well, was it funny? It's pretty interesting. Uh, you know, when this film came out, it was 2002, if I remember correctly. And people were like, how dare they make a book, make a movie about the two towers? Like, you moron, get out from under your rock and live, you know. Um, is it the Tower of Orthanc? Because that's one of them, pretty definitely. In Sauron's Tower of Paradur is a kind of Tower of Orthanc, and the Tower in Minas Tirith, or is it the Tower of Orthanc in this one? I think the the bets, so to speak, are on these two, right? Because of what happens in this one very soon. So, they agree to go with Gollum, and 
page 644. Frodo's thinking, and the narrator tells us a lot of what's going on in Frodo's mind. In the very end of the long paragraph in the middle of that page, Frodo thinks, it was an evil fate. But he had taken it on himself in his own sitting room in the far off spring of another year, so remote now. Far off spring of another year was when? It was just last year. It's not even been nine months. Right? So remote now that it was like a chapter in a story of the world's youth. In other words, it's like he is in part of a long story. This is going to be important later. When the trees of silver and gold were still in bloom. That's the only reference, if I remember correctly, Tolkien makes to the trees of silver and gold in the Lord of the Rings. Nobody had a clue what it referred to. You had to wait until 1977 when the Silmarillion was published to find out what those referred to. Those are the trees that light the world in Valinor way back before the world was you know, broken and such. This was an evil choice. Which way should he chooses. What do I do? Follow Gollum and go down to this third way, or try and heal? And we come in to Eva Black Gate. And if both led to terror and death, what good lay in choice? What does that second question mean? If both lay in terror and death, if both choices result in death, What's his real question? Why choose? Why not just sit down and let Sauron find the ring? Right? So, they finally agree to go. And they march south. Chapter 4 of Herbs and Stewed Rabbit. So they make their way into the land called Ithilien. And what does Sam ask Gollum to do? He refers to the tiger. Go catch some rabbits. Why? Because Sam's hungry? Because Sam needs meat? No. Frodo has gotten thin. And Sam's like, need to fatten him up. We got a long journey yet ahead of us. The only problem is, in order to cook the rabbits to make the stew, what must he do? Build a fire, smoke. They get captured, page 657. So men captured them. And one of them refers to, excuse me, right in the middle of 657, the tallest of them says, I am Faramir, captain of Gondor. If there are no travelers in this land, only servants of the Dark Tower or of the White. Okay. Now, the Dark Tower refers to Barad-dûr. The White Tower refers to Minas Tirith. So, which are you? Okay. They keep talking, and Faramir mentions a couple lines from the poem that Boromir brought to Rivendell. Are you familiar with it? Excuse me. Frodo refers those to Faramir. And Faramir says, yes, indeed. Why are they familiar? What did Boromir tell them at the Council of Elrond? The dream came to Faramir first. And it came to him several times. And then it came once to Boromir. In other words, these words are indelibly imprinted on Faramir's mind. Yeah, I'm familiar with them. Okay. So Faramir then asks, what's this will do thing? That is, since you brought it up, Frodo, uh, that's it. Can't tell you. So they keep going on. And they run into a skirmish. Bottom of 660, top of 661. Sam sees his first death in a human war. 
Sam, notice, eager to see more, went now and joined the guards. Scrambles up into some bay trees, and he sees a man fall, crashing through the trees, the green arrow feathers sticking from his neck. His scarlet robes, top of 661, were tattered. His corslet of overlapping brazen plates, rent and hewn, his black plates of hair braided with gold, drenched with blood. Brown hands still clutched the hilt of a broken sword. It was Sam's first view of a battle of men against men, and he did not like it much. He was glad that he could not see the dead face. He wondered what the man's name was and where he came, came from and if he was really evil of heart or what lies or threats had led him on the long march from his home and if he would not really rather have stayed there in peace. And all of that comes in a flash of light. What has Sam just experienced? What has Sam just done to this dead guy? What, you know, we talked about this earlier in the chapter of the Shadow of the Past when Frodo calls Gollum just an enemy. Well, what does just an enemy deserve, according to Frodo? Death. Right? And we talked about what makes it easier to kill someone in war. You dehumanize them. You demonize them. Right? Sam is rehumanizing this guy. Notice, or what lies or threats had led him on? Sam's asking, is this guy really evil of heart? Does he intend evil? Or have those in power and authority over him lied to him? Or, notice, threatened him. You go do this, or we will kill your children or we will kill your family, or we will take your goods. Okay. And wouldn't he really have just rather stayed at home in peace? And boom! The blink of an instant, Sam thinks all of that. Okay. Why does Tolkien do that? Because he is not celebrating the war. Have you heard the story of I think it was 1915 when, when this supposedly happened. You had German forces on one side of a piece of land, and you had English forces on another side. And it was Christmas Eve. Everybody know the story I'm talking about? And they stopped, because there was a temporary ceasefire, they stopped shooting, and they started singing to each other a hymn both sides knew. Silent night. The Germans singing it in German, but the English speak, singing it in English. Why? Because the music is the same. And the Germans would sing one verse, if I remember correctly, and the English would sing another. And this went on. Not just Silent Night, but other Christmas carols. And then the next morning, and they're back to you know, slaughtering each other. Because this is my Showing what? The grunts in the fields, in the trenches, they don't want to, they didn't want to be there. They were following orders. They had been told, if you don't do this, these other people are going to wipe you out, blah, 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 blah. Right? So, Sam then gets to see his oliphants, elephants, which we had referred to earlier. And Fairmere and the others take them to the window on the west, which is their hideout, right? Page 664. Hold on a second. 663. Fairmere asks Frodo, are you the halfling that the verse spoke of? Frodo doesn't answer. 
Faramir takes that for reaction. Okay? So he says, I want to know what happened. And he says, um, Faramir, uh, Frodo responds, Aragorn, if you want to know who led us, it was Aragorn. After Gandalf, why Aragorn? Why not Borg? And he says, because Aragorn is descended from Isildur and Indosan, and he has the sword that was broken. That's now been remade. And the men are like, whoa, Arthur back from the dead, you know. So, Faramir, yeah, but that's going to have to be proven. We're going to need to do a DNA test to make sure he's really who he, you know, that kind of thing. And Frodo says, Boromir was satisfied. If Boromir were here, he would answer all your questions. He says, oh, so, so Boromir will tell us all when he comes. Okay. You're a friend of Boromir? Yes, I was a friend for my part. Then you agreed to learn Boromir's death. I would agree to the deed. And then Frodo, you know, light bulb goes on. He's dead. What does finding out Boromir is dead, what does that make Frodo think? If Boromir's dead, how can the others be alive, right? Boromir was the mightiest, you know, man, so to speak. I'm leaving Aragorn aside for a moment. He was alive, man, when we left. I'm telling you, he was alive. That's all I got to say. Okay. So, Faramir says, you know, mentions treachery, and that, that sets Sam off. Sam, you know, stands up right as to his full three feet, two inches height, you know, and says 665, begging your pardon, Mr. Frodo. This has gone on long enough. He's no right to talk to you so. After all you've gone through, as much for his good and all these great men as for anyone else. See here, Captain, plants himself. And he says, come on, what are you driving at? Get the, you know, and Faramir says, shut up. Patience, right? And then he explains, boring you with and he tells them about the dream and then about finding the boat that had Boromir in it with the cloven horn and all the arrows and weapons surrounding him. That's when Frodo says, I fear that my friends must all be dead. And Boromir's mad. You're not very bright. Because if all your friends were dead, who put Boromir in the boat? So somebody had to live, right? Uh, skip a bunch. Page 668. So Frodo says, no, I didn't know Boromir died. I didn't know any of that. And he says, will you put aside your doubt of me and let me go? I'm weary, full of grief, and afraid. I have a deed to do or attempt before I too am free. And the more need of haste, if we too have links or all that remain of our fellowship. Go back, Faramir, captain of Gondor. Defend your city while you may. Let me go where my doom takes me. Go back, Faramir, to Gondor. And live while you can. That's the while you may. Defend Gondor while you may. Because what is he implying? It won't be long. Gondor will fall. And let me and my companion go and do what? Die in our attempt. Let me go where my doom takes me. He's using doom the same way Boromir did when he heard the poem, or when he recited the poem. Okay? So, Faramir says, I don't doubt you anymore. You know, I, I trust you. I, I hear you. But then later on he says, um, well, we're going to stop talking. Because we won't be able to talk about it. 669. Faramir says, I broke up our speech because we were getting close to some things like Isildur's bane. You were not wholly frank with me, Frodo. I told no lies and all the truth I could. And no, 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 I, I, I get it. You spoke with skill in a hard place. He says, But I learned more from you than you think I did. He says, I knew my brother very well. And Isildur's bane came between you and me. Do I not 
Get near the mark. Am I close? Yeah, pretty close. Not in the gold, that is. You're not dead on. Your trouble was with Borg and your own. You didn't have any troubles with the other members of your company. He wished this thing brought to you good. Why? It is a crooked fate that seals your lips. You saw him last week, center and center. Okay? So they keep talking. 670, they talked about Gandalf and such. 671. Uh, Faramir tells Frodo what in truth this thing is. I cannot yet guess. It's some heirloom of power and pearl it must be. Skip to the next paragraph. Peter Jackson completely discounts this in the film. Fear no more. I would not take this thing if it lay by the highway. That is, if I'm just walking down the road and I see this thing on the ground, I would not pick it up and claim it for myself. Not where Menace Tear is falling in ruin and I alone could save her. So, thus, using the weapon of the Dark Lord for her good and my glory. No, I do not wish for such triumphs. Frodo, neither did the council, nor do I. I would have nothing to do with such matters. In other words, believe me, I don't want this responsibility either. Okay? So what did Spearman just told us? No matter what, I wouldn't claim it, and I wouldn't use it. Even if it were to save God. Right? And he tells Frodo what he would like to see. He would like to see the white tree flower again. The only way the white tree will get, come into flower is what? Anybody know? There has to be a king sitting on the throne of God. It's the only way that tree can rebloom. There is a dead tree now sitting in the courtyard in Minas Tirith. They don't know how that tree is going to rebloom, but they think, they believe, when there is a king, a new sapling will be found, right? So they keep walking on. They make their way to the window on the west. And he tells them about Gollum. They've seen Gollum, et cetera, et cetera. Page 680. They talk about Galadriel. Fairmer says she must be lovely indeed. Perilously fair. Perilously beautiful. That is so beautiful you could die from her beauty. Sam, I don't know about Paradis. Strikes me, folk takes their fur with them, and Tenorian flies it there because they brought it. Now Bor I'm skipping a bunch. The Fairmer's like, yes. Now Boromir, you were gonna say? Yes, sir, begging your pardon. Fine man as your brother was, if I may say so, but you've been warm on set all along. I watched Boromir, and he, well, skipping a bunch, he wanted the enemy's ring. And Sam Frodo's like, Sam, it's the on the ingray, you know? And he's like, oops. He says, now you have a chance to show your quality. Fair mirror, now you have a chance to prove what you said before. Fair man. Oh, I get it now. The ring. The one ring of power. The ring the enemy desires and needs above everything else. Boromir wanted. Couldn't get. And you deliver it to me. Frodo and Sam back up, back to back. Pull out their little swords. You know, which are like this long. And what happens? Just as we saw at the end of the Mirror of Galadriel... Faramir passes his test. He doesn't claim it. He doesn't try to take it. He tells them, you're a poor judge of character. I told you before. Not if I found it on the highway would I take it. And he says, and even if I were such a man as to desire it, I should take those words as a vow. That is, even if I did want it, I promise. 
My honor, my integrity is on the line. Right? But I am not such a man, or I am wise enough to know there are some perils from which a man must flee. No, no. Sit at peace. Be comforted. So why did I say Peter Jackson completely blows us? Anybody know? He has Faramir start taking Frodo and Sam back to his father. He doesn't get all the way there. They get released in Osgiliath. Completely destroys this character. Okay? Because he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand it. He sees it as sword and sorcery. Right? So, they capture Gollum. And they kind of test Gollum. I'm skipping obviously a bunch. Frodo has to trick Gollum. Okay? And Gollum tells him, yes, there is another way. Faramir's like, yeah, but you haven't told him where. You know, what's it called? What's it called? What's it called? And he finally says, Faramir does. And Gollum says, that's, that's it. No. The Morgul veil, Minas Morgul. And he says, there's no evil in him right now, but, you know, I wouldn't trust him. Frodo's like, well, what else are you going to have us do? we got to try to destroy it. Uh, can you lead us? Nope. <laughs> no, not me. Uh -uh, not going there. And then we got to follow. He says, okay. Journey to the Crossroads, chapter 7. We're supposed to be done, I think, with Return of the King today. So I'm at least trying to get us through the end of all of two times. Journey to the Crossroads. So they make their way. Through the crossroads, they've um, lost Gollum. Page 700. Brother's like, well, good. Maybe, uh, Sam's like, well, good. Maybe we've lost him for good. Right? And Frodo's like, no, remember, he helped us through the marshes. We would have died without him there, Sam. Hope nothing's happened to him. Sam, hope he's not up to any tricks. Okay. And at that moment, a rolling and rumbling noise was heard again, louder now and deeper. The sound, the ground seemed to quiver under their feet. I think we're in for trouble anyhow. Sam, maybe where there's life, there's hope. In other words, we're not dead yet, you know, Mr. Frodo. So, Gollum comes back. They make their way to the crossroads. The crossroads are going north-south, essentially, east-west. Okay. One of them goes off to the sea. And you can see down through that crossroads, the sun sets. Bottom of page 702. And just before it dips over the horizon, its rays come and shine on something. Page 702. Standing, I'm going to read this long passage. Standing there for a moment, filled with dread, Frodo became aware that a light was shining. He saw it glowing on Sam's face beside him. Turning towards it, he saw, beyond an arch about, the road to Osgiliath, running almost as straight as a stretch driven down, down into the west. There, far away, beyond sad Gondor, now overwhelmed in shade, the sun was sinking, finding at last the hem of the great blah, blah, blah. So, Frodo sees, when they got there, Frodo saw there had been a statue of a king. And the statue had been knocked off and the head of the king lying on the ground. Suddenly, caught by the level beams, Frodo saw the old king's head. It was lying rolled away by the roadside. Look, Sam, he cried. Look, the king has got a crown again. The eyes were hollow, the carven beard was broken, but about the high stern forehead there was a corona of silver and gold. The trailing plant with flowers like small white stars had bound itself across the brows as if in reverence for the fallen king. So this vine had wound itself around the stone head's forehead. And in the crevices of his stony hair, a yellow stone crop gleamed, that is, a kind of flower. They cannot conquer forever. Because what happens at that point? 
the sunlight shines and it reveals this head and it's shining on him like this is a sign of the king. All right? Medieval literature. Oftentimes in medieval literature, King Horn, Havelock the Dane, just a couple of romances that show this. A king or somebody who is born to be king but is not recognized as a prince, etc., is revealed because of a mark. Sometimes it's a birthmark in a couple of those. God, which one is it? Havelock the Dane, in fact, I think it's in both of those. Uh, Havelock the Dane, guy who's supposed to be king. No, take it back. King Horn, guy who's supposed to be king. He sleeps and he sleeps with his mouth open. And somebody stumbled upon him, and they noticed a light coming out of his mouth. That's the sign of, you know, this guy is meant to be king. They cannot conquer forever. Who's the they? Darkness, chaos. This is a eucatastrophe. This is a little element, a little, you know, um, bit of the natural environment telling Frodo all is not lost. There is still hope. We saw that back with Gandalf and Theoden, right? When they go out on the porch outside the hall and we see the light shine through the clouds. Just a little glimmer of light. And it turns what was gray into gleaming silver. And then says, all is not dark here. Right? And then the sun dips, and the vision is gone, and it's blackness. Notice, when the sun dips beneath, beneath the horizon, it's not like in our world, or at least not in this instance, right? Sun goes beneath the horizon, is it immediately pitch black? No. Even twilight. So we get chapter 8, the stairs of Kirith Ungol. This is where we're going to get backed up more, probably. So they make their way up the stairs of Kirith Ungol. Page 711. They're talking. Gollum says, yes, all ways are watched. That is, every way to get into Mordor is watched. There are spies, you know, eyes everywhere. And page 711. They kind of reach like a landing, and they stop for a moment. They're thirsty. They have a little bit of water, but not much. They hear water trickling, but they're like, yeah, I don't want to drink this water. And toward the bottom of 7-Eleven, Sam says, I smell something. I don't like it, Frodo. I don't like anything here at all. Step or stone, breath or bone, earth, air, and water all seem accursed. But so our path is laid. Now, back at the uh, passage of the dead marshes, what did he say to Gollum? How do we choose our path? Not, this is how our path is laid. See, choosing your path implies you have what? Free will. How your path is laid means you can't deviate. You can't step off of it. Well, they are where? They're in a tunnel going up a mountain. They can't go right or left. There haven't been any offshoots, at least yet. Sam, yes, that's so. You're right, Mr. Frodo. This is how our path is laid. And we shouldn't be here at all if we'd known more about it before we started. Meaning, what and when? It's spring day back in your home. If Mr. Gandalf had told us this is where we would find ourselves, what is Sam telling us? How many of you are familiar with Princess Bride? Not many, that's a shame. It's Billy Crystal's character and... and um, Carol Kane selling, telling Wesley and the others, have fun storming the castle. I think you have a chance to have her, you know. 
Sam would be saying to Frodo, have fun going to Mordor. I'm not coming. But that's not what he says. We should be in awe if we know more about it before we start. But I suppose it's often that way. The brave things in the old tales and songs, Mr. Frodo, adventures as I used to call them. I used to think they were things the wonderful folk of the stories went out and looked for because they wanted them. That is, the people in, let's use some of the terms Aragorn uses earlier, in the legends or the myths. Sam says, I used to think they wanted these wonderful experiences because they were exciting. Life was a bit dull. A kind of a sport, as you might say. But that's not the way of it with the tales that we read today or the ones that stay in the mind. Here they are, marching into Mordor. They're taking a, you know, a little bit of R&R. &R. And what does Sam suddenly turn into? A pretty deep literary critic. He's analyzing fairy stories for us. Okay? He says, in those tales, folks seem to have been just landed in them, really. Usually, their paths were laid that way, as you put it. But I expect they had lots of chances like us of turning back, only they didn't. And if they had, we shouldn't know, because they'd have been forgotten. We hear about those as just went on, and not all to a good end, mind you, at least not to what folk inside a story and not outside it call a good end. I'll give you an example. You may not be familiar with this name at all. Anybody know who that is? Was? He was one of the guys on Flight 93 that was taken down above Pennsylvania on 9-11. 32-year-old software sales. He had just gotten back the day before he and his wife had returned from a trip to Italy. That day, he had a flight to San Francisco for a meeting, a flight to meeting flying back that day at 9-11. He was one of the guys that we actually have a record of his phone call that he made from the plane, speaking to a call center operator. He was trying to call his wife. He never got through to her. But he was on the phone for 13 minutes with this call center operator. And he told her what we're going to do. Because he and three of the other guys, all former athletes in college, football, baseball, soccer, okay, they said, we're going to stop this. Because they had already received word, because people's cell phones were ringing, what the other two planes had already done. The three planes. They'd already heard about the Pentagon and the Twin, Twin Towers. So Beamer and these other men decided we're going to take, the, take control of this plane. We're not going to let it fly into either the White House or the Capitol. Okay? And his last words, recorded by the woman on the phone, were, let's roll. Okay? That morning, they had no idea that was going to be their last day. But once they found out what happened, look at what Sam says. Folks seem to have been just landed in them, usually. He didn't wake up that morning thinking, I'm going to become a hero. And yet, if I remember right, there is a monument in the town that he lived in to him and the three other, three other named guys that were on that flight. Burkett and I can't remember the other two names, other two men. He says, I expect they had a lot of chances like us of turning back. See, there's the difference. This is real life story. But they did have chances of turning back. How do we know? Because they 
didn't have to do it, they did. They didn't have to rise up. They didn't have to say, we're going to take this land back. Because there was cockpit voice recorders of what was going on in the cockpit while they were trying to break through the gates. They actually, they voice recorded survivors. Right? Cam goes on. We hear about those as just went on and not all to a good end. At least not to what goes inside the story. What was five months pregnant? Daughter was born four months, January 9th, something like that, of 2002. Not to what folks inside a story and not outside of all the good end. Because pretty much everybody, well, every American says, Good end. Think of the difference. Just try to, you know, wrap your mind around. Think of that. If that plane hadn't been taken down over Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and had instead flown into the Capitol, there's lots of, you know, discussion. Was it aiming for the White House or the Capitol? The guy that was flying that plane, the, the terrorist that was flying that plane, was not trained on a 757. He, was only, he only got flight training on a single engine plane, like a Cessna. Okay. And thing article I read just the other day said, if you get up, because somebody did this, if you get up and you get a 757 and you do the same flight pattern they did, when you come into the DC area, it is like there is a, a landing strip going straight down the mall to the Capitol building. Whereas the White House is hard to see because the White House has other office buildings all around it. It's not an easy landmark. Go to DC. I mean, the National Mall is a mile long and like 300 yards wide. It's just like pointing to the Capitol building. Wouldn't be that hard to have taken that. Think of the difference that would have made if the Capitol building had been there with anybody possibly who'd been in. So, you know, here's what he calls a good end. You know, coming home and finding things all right, though not quite the same, like old Mr. Bilbo. See, when Bilbo came home at the end of The Hobbit, his cousins were inside the house selling everything. They got him in bed. He was like, get the hell out of here, you know? Grabbing his stuff back. That is, it's pretty much the same, but a little different. But those aren't always the best tales to hear. The ones where the person goes home and things are pretty much the same, but a little different. He says, those aren't always the best tales to hear. Though they may be the best deals to get landed in. I'll bet you, if he had the choice, Todd Beamer and the others would have rather landed in the tail where they got home safely. Or all the other people who were on the other flights. Or all the people who were working that morning in the Twin Towers. Right. Notice what Sam is saying. Sometimes. The best tales to hear are this happened. Tolkien in the fairy story essay says in relation to children, fairy stories can give to children a sense of you know, importance more than just themselves. They can bestow, he says, on callow youth a sense of, how does he put it, dignity, and a couple other things, you know, a, a kind of a respect for death, that death can be good. I wonder what sort of a tale we've fallen into. Incredible. I wonder. But I don't know. What has Frodo already kind of implied to us? What did he tell Faramir? Go back to Gondor and fight while you may. Let me what? 
let me take my in other words, let me die in my sins. But I don't know, and that's the way of a real hell. Pick any one that you're fond of. You may know or guess what kind of tale it is. Happy ending? You catastrophic fairy tale, Tolkien's language from the fairy story essay, or sad ending, like in every Greek tragedy or every Shakespearean tragedy. They all end in sadness. That's part of the definition of tragedy there. Right? But the people in it don't know. And you don't want them to. Why? Why would you not want a Todd Beaver or any of those other people to not know what was going to happen within two hours after getting on that flight? It might not have ever happened. Why? I'm not getting on that flight. You know, there's all kinds of weird accounts of that morning of people who were supposed to be on some of those flights who just got the willies for some reason. They had an odd feeling, and they didn't get on their flights. And have been wrapped with survivor's guilt. Because they're thinking, oh, why? Why? I was supposed to be. Why? Sam. No, sir, of course not. Sam's like, you're right, Mr. Frodo. Baron now. Remember Baron and Luthien Tenubio that Aragorn sang to them about? He never thought he was going to get that Silmaril from the Iron Crown of Thangordrim. Yet he did. That was the worst place back, blacker danger than ours. But that's a long tale. Goes on past the happiness into grief and beyond it. Because in that tale, Baron dies after he gets the Silmaril. But the gods kind of bring them back to life and let them live for a while, for a while with Luthien and Tenubio, and then he dies again. So he gets the tragic death, he gets a little bit of bliss, and then he dies again. And Luthien dies with him, and then they go off and leave Middle Earth forever. Right? That's the passiness and the grief beyond it. And the Silmaril went on and came to Arando, and the light bulb goes off. He says, and Mr. Frodo never thought of that. We, we've got some of the life of it in that star glass. That if you're carrying that file around your neck that has light from the Silmaril that Baron got, that was given to Arendil, that was turned into a star that made the light that shone in Galadriel's mirror that is now filling we're in the same tale still. Don't the great tales never end? Frodo, no, they never end for us. Why? Back to the fairy story essay. Because all stories, Tolkien suggests in the epilogue, all stories are mere echoes of the one true story, which he says the story is of the Incarnation. But the people in them come and go in their parts of them. Our part will end later. Period. Or sooner. What is Frodo revealing to us? He has almost no hope at this point. Okay. He is he is that close to being overcome by the ring. Right? So, Sam asks, top of 713, they start talking about Gollum, because Gollum's not there. And Sam's like, huh, even Gollum might be good in a tale. Frodo, uh, Tolkien giving us a little foreshadowing possibly there. Better than he is to have by you anyway. What if he thinks he's the hero of the world? Right? And that's when he calls off. Golly, what do you want to be? And he's not there. So they fall asleep. Sam tells Frodo, 
You sleep, I'll keep watch. Bottom of the next page, 714. And Sam falls asleep. And hours later, Gollum finds them. And we're told, Sam sat propped against the stone, his head dropping sideways, his breathing heavy. In his lap lay Frodo's head, drowned deep in sleep. Upon his white forehead lay one of Sam's brown hands. The other lay softly upon his master's breast. Peace was in both their faces. Why does Sam have one hand on Frodo's head and another hand on his chest? If he moves, Sam wakes up. This is protection. This is, this is alarm. You know, you move, I'm going to stir. So, we get this description. Gollum looked at them. A strange expression passed over his lean, hungry face. The gleam faded from his eyes. And they went dim and gray, cold and powder. A spasm of pain seemed to twist him. And he turned away, peering back up towards the pass, shaking his head as if engaged in some interior debate. So he sees them, and we're told he suddenly looks old and weary and worn out. And he looks back up from the pass that he just came back down from. Shakes his head. What's the interior debate? Do I go through with it? Do I give them, essentially, to Shelob? Then he came back, slowly putting out a trembling hand. He very cautiously touches Frodo's knee. But almost the touch was a caress. A, just a gentle rubbing. For a fleeting moment, could one of the sleepers have seen him, they would have thought that they beheld an old, weary hobbit, shrunken by the years that had carried him far beyond his time, beyond friends and kin, in the fields and streams of youth, an old, starved, pitiable thing. What is that image meant to convey? Well, first of all, you need to know what it means symbolically to reach out and touch someone's knee. In classical literature, Greek and Roman, through the at least part of the Middle Ages, when someone wants to supplicate, pray to, beg somebody for mercy or for a reward of some kind or something, what they do, or a blessing, what they do is they either put their hands on the person whose favor they are seeking, put their hands on their knees, put their arms around and clasp their knees, or put their head on the individual's knee. Okay? You see it in the Old Testament. Right? You see it in Roman literature. You see it in Greek literature. One of the greatest examples is in Virgil's Aeneid. The character, I think it is Turnus, seeks mercy from Aeneas, the founder of, of uh, Rome. Okay? And he's begging mercy. He's got his arms around his knees and his head on his knees. And Aeneas says, no. <laughs> you know, stabs him down through the back. Okay? Gollum reaches out and touches Frodo on the knee. That's got to be intentional. He doesn't touch him on the foot. He doesn't touch him on the shoulder. He doesn't touch him on the hand. He touches on the knee. This is like mercy. Be merciful to me. Right? And then we get that description of how old and pitiable he is. But what happens? Frodo stirs. Sam wakes up. And he sees Gollum pawing at Master. Hey, you. What are you up to? Nothing. Nothing. My Notice Gollum doesn't reply, doesn't reply angrily, hastily. I dare say, what have you been up to? Where have you been sneaking off and sneaking back? You old villain! And you look at the description. Gollum withdrew himself. That means two things at least. It means physically he pulls back. What else does it mean? Emotionally, that 
The tent was drawn back, and a green glint flickered under his heavy lids. With all but one exception, how is glinting eyes used throughout the Lord of the Rings? It's evil. Boromir's eyes glint when he sees the ring. The only time that doesn't occur is when Gandalf's eyes glint when Frodo, excuse me, when Bilbo accuses Gandalf of wanting the ring for himself. And there you could say it's righteous anger. <laughs> right? But whenever someone has a green glint, it's always indicating the evil on that individual part. And almost spider-like, nice little foreshadowing there, he looked now. How did he look when he came down the cliffside of the Indian mule? Spider-like. Right? So what do we see? Chapter 9, She Loves Lair. Which we're going to skip a bunch. That's what we're going to skip all of. She Love comes in. Sam fights Shelob off. Chapter 10, Choice of the Master Samwise. He sees Frodo lying face upward, the monster bending over him. Okay? He goes, he rescues Frodo, he holds up Sting, because he's taking Sting from Frodo. Right? He holds up Sting, Shelob brings her body down on. How big is Shelob? you know, put a big old circle in here, 10, 12, 15 feet diameter. Legs reach to the, you know, front and back legs reach to the corners of this room. Big stinking spider. So if you have things with spiders, you don't want to be there. And it comes down on, and he's just holding it up, and she flees, right? Sam wakes up after passing out. And what's he see? Page 731. Here's Frodo, and Frodo's all bound. Right? And Frodo looks dead. What does Sam apparently not do? <laughs> does he have a pulse, you know? Hold a mirror up to his mouth. Is he breathing? 732, the choices of Master Samwise. Why does Sam have to make a choice? Louder. Okay. Why is he there? Why is Sam there in this predicament? Why were the other eight members of the fellowship appointed? To assist Frodo. To make sure this adventure does not fail. Sam doesn't do it, who will? He knows what's going to happen if the ring gets found. Sauron wins, turn out the lights, you know, because darkness reigns supreme. And he says, 732, what? Me? Go alone to crack a doom and all? Me? Take the ring from him? The council gave it to him. No, they didn't. They didn't give it to him. It wasn't the council's to give. Who had it all along? Frodo did. It's the council gave him the charge to carry it. He already carried it. But the answer came at once. The council gave him companions so that Aaron should not fail. Aaron must not fail. I wish it wasn't. And there we go. All the way back to the beginning. I wish it had not happened in my day. And Gandalf says, really? Yeah, so do we all. Next point. So, Sam says, i got to make up my own mind. That is, I don't have Gandalf to give me advice. I don't have Galadriel to give me advice. I don't have Elrond. I've got Sam. Okay. His name means half-wise. Sam-wise. Sam means half. So, if you're half-wise, how wise are you? It means you're dense. Like, you, you know, in the light of this table. That's why he's a gardener. I'm not knocking gardeners, he used to be one. Okay? So, what does Sam do? Bottom of 732. 
let me see now. And he does the proverbial, pulls out the yellow legal pad, pros, cons. I gotta take it. I gotta take it. So, he takes the ring. He keeps Sting, because he got that from Frodo previously. He takes the file. Not gonna do Frodo any good, right? But it might help him in dark places, because what happened when Frodo claimed a Elbereth Gilthonial light shot in the caves, right? So Sam runs off, and then he hears voices. Orcs coming. And he listens to the orcs. And what does he hear? Frodo's not dead. Frodo's just preserved. She doesn't eat dead things, right? No. She's going to take them off, hang them up, and then she's going to liquefy them and suck the insides off. That's what spiders do. They inject the venom. The venom it liquefies what is inside, whatever the body is, and then it sucks it out. Nice. And this book ends with Sam locked outside the tower and Frodo taken captive by the orcs. But at least he doesn't have the ring. And it ends, and then we have to wait, I think it is, 11 months to find out what happened. We get the return of the king. We've got nine minutes still. Book five. Minas Tirith. What the? Come on, Tolkien. And who do we pick up with? Pippin and Gandalf. Way back here, after the Palantir episode. And they're riding on their way to Minas Tirith. All right? So, they get to Minas Tirith, and they're taken to Denethor, page 753. Before they go into Denethor's presence, Denethor is the steward of Gondor, father of Boromir and Faramir. Okay? Gandalf warns Pippin. 5 and 753. Be careful of your word, Master Peregrine. This is no time for Hobbit pertinent. Theoden is a kindly old man. Denethor is of another sort. Proud, subtle, a man of far greater lineage and power, though he's not called the king. He will speak most to you, question you much, since you can tell him of his son Boromir. He loved him greatly. Too much, perhaps. How can you love some your face? How can you love someone too much? How can you love your child too much? How can you love your spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever? Too much. Ben Johnson, 17th century um, English poet, wrote a poem on the death of his son. Okay. Son died when he was seven. Also wrote a poem on the death of his first daughter. First son, first daughter. They both died here. She died at six months. Okay. And in his poem on his son, he says something about, you know, loving the child, loving him too much. Okay. And my students usually, when I do that poem, they're like, how? How many of you have I shouldn't ask that question. You've all heard of overbearing parents, right? Parents who kind of do what? Or want to do what? Put it that way. Make all your decisions for you. Run your life. You know? You've heard of stories of people get married and the bride has no say in the wedding. Why? Because mama's calling the shots. Because mama's going to get the wedding. Mama wished she had, but didn't get, so to speak kind of bad. It's like he places, the suggestion is, all of his hopes and dreams in his eldest son. Okay. And the more so because they were unalike. That is, Gandalf's telling us, Boromir was not like them. But under cover of this love, he will think it easier to learn what he wishes from you rather than from me. Don't tell him more than you need. Don't 
mention Aragorn. Why not? What's wrong with Strider? Notice, don't mention Aragorn. Strider is what Pippin hears. He meant to come here, didn't he? He'll be arriving soon himself. Maybe, maybe. He says, you know, but he shouldn't come announced by us. And finally, Gandalf has to spell it out. When Aragorn comes, if Aragorn comes, it is scarcely wise when bringing the news of the death of his heir to a mighty lord to speak over much of the coming of one who will, if he comes, claim the kingship. If Aragorn comes, he will claim the kingship. Kingship? Why does Pippin not know that Aragorn is the future king of Gondor? Let's, let's be overly fair on Pippin's part. What is one reason why he doesn't know? He wasn't in the Council of Elrond. The only hobbits that were present there were Bilbo, Frodo, and Sam. And Sam was only there because he wasn't going to leave Frodo's side. I mean, even Elrond said, you weren't supposed to be here. And Sam's like, Try it. Okay? So he wasn't there. So do you think that nobody said anything afterwards? Even the poem that Gandalf included in the letter to Barlam and Butterbur, or to Frodo, Barlam, that implied who Erwan really was. Gandalf, yes, if you have walked all these days with closed ears and mind asleep, wake up. Come on, Pippin. Don't be such a damn fool all the time. Bear in mind, and I don't think I mentioned this. <clears throat> Gandalf is what now? Gandalf the White, right? Why is he Gandalf the White? Louder? Defeated the Balrog, died. Came back. Why did he defeat the Balrog? Why did he have to fight the Balrog? Keep going back. Pippin drops the stone. And that does what? Like the language Gandalf uses about when Merry and Pippin come to Treebeard, that sets an avalanche in motion. Well, where did the avalanche begin? When Pippin drops the stone. Gandalf would not be Gandalf the White if Pippin had never dropped the stone. If they'd gone silently through the mines of Moria, Gandalf would still be Gandalf the Grey. And he wouldn't have been able to say, Sarah Man, come back. I have passed through death. Okay, I, who was dead, I'm alive again. You know, none of that would have happened. All right? Pretty important. Okay, we'll stop there since there's only a couple minutes. So we're gonna, we'll pick up, man, we're so close. Oh no, we finished two towers. Ah, well, confusing. Uh, sure, the right book. Okay, so we'll pick up with that chapter about page 755 on Thursday. So we'll. Quiz last week was over the second half of Fellowship of the Ring, correct? We'll do a quiz this week over two towers. The whole thing. Pick up. <clears throat>